to record as well. So welcome to everybody watching this. My name is Jonathan Cohn. I am the, I, I'm the communications director for Young Democrats of Massachusetts. Um, delighted to have two uh, fellow Young Dems from the Massachusetts legislature here uh, to give us an update about what's, what's been happening in the Massachusetts legislature or in, kind of in terms of the response to COVID-19, what we should be expecting soon, and what they would particularly like to see happen. I'll give a shout out to Andrew, who will be joining in to ask some questions as well. Andrew, if you want to just give a brief introduction. Yeah, uh, my name is Andrew. I am a newly minted young Democrat, and I look forward to this session. Awesome. Uh, and then so the, the two great reps that we have joining us today are representatives Jack Patrick Lewis and Maria Robinson, both from, uh, both from Framingham. If you want to just quickly introduce yourselves for folks? Sure. My name is Maria Robinson. I'm finishing out my first term in the House of Representatives, um, and I represent about 65% of the great city of Framingham, along with... And I'm Jack Lewis. I represent most of what remains uh, of Framingham, approximately one third of Framingham, uh, and the great town of Ashland. I'm just in the midst of my second term uh, in the Massachusetts House. Nice. So one thing that I'll, I'll lead with, since uh, like a large development just happened in the in the House today, that I believe like a, a new kind of order adopting a set of rules to allow for remote voting. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what that? about what that entails and why the ability to vote remotely is so important. Sure, um, I'll lead off. And so it's hugely important that we can vote remotely. A lot of things have to be done either constitutionally um, by a roll call vote. So we cannot just pass things like bond bills or budget bills via informal session, which is what we've been using um, in this interim period of time. Um, usually on average we meet once a week or once every two or so weeks in formal session to do what you would typically think of as being in the legislature. Um, and then the rest of the time there are these sparsely attended informal sessions where we talk about land takings and um, sick leave banks for people um, and things that need to happen through the legislature but don't necessarily require all 160 people to show up and vote on. And so uh, because of that, we haven't really been able to uh, push as hard as we'd like on some of these pieces of legislation. Now we have gotten a lot done. Um, I point specifically to the evictions law um, that, that passed, but of course that had some drama associated with it with one Republican um, shutting down the first informal session, as is his right. Um, every any member can shut down an informal session, which is what makes them hard to pass anything even vaguely controversial. And quickly, and quickly, what is an informal session for those who don't know the term? Yeah, so informal, um, it means we constitutionally have to meet every 72 hours or so. So we have these informal sessions to meet our constitutional obligation um, and then sort of move, move things from, you know, rules committee or moving bills into a committee, you know, so, some basic stuff that just needs to happen to keep the legislature moving. And it's rare that we almost, almost never pass big bills in informal session. Informal session is also what happens after the end of formal session, which typically runs until the end of July of even years. Um, so then the rest of that year, it's the legislature still working, but is in informal session. And, and so um, our hope as progressives, um, as young Dems here, who are for the most part also progressives, um, we, we want to pass a lot of bills. We want to pass a lot of legislation in order to help people um, through COVID. And in order to do that, we have to have some sort of means of meeting. And at the same time, I can't think of anything, well, I was gonna say I can't think of anything dumber, but I recognize there was a protest at the State House today. But um, getting 160 people who live in all different parts of the state together in one room where we all sit relatively close to one another seems like a very silly public health decision. Um, so the fact that they're making it so only a couple people have to go in 
Um, most people can vote from the uh, comfort of their own homes. Jeff will be in the same room that you see him in right now uh, when we have formal session on Wednesday. Uh, and so, and we'll still be able to make sure that his children are, you know, fed and learned and alive, all of which are very important for all of us right now. Um, so that gives us the opportunity to do that. So we have a system that's um, basically a, a massive conference call system set up to allow people to both access debate and so they'll um, tap you into uh, the loudspeaker, or for lack of a better word, the mic system. Um, and then everyone will be able to watch it remotely the same way that we currently can watch um, online if you're not there in person. So in so debate, we, just quickly, in debate, is it just audio from people or are they able to, let's say, like video conference in when it's time for debate? So we haven't gotten all of the very specific details of it, but it appears to be conference line only. But what you can do is you can see what's happening because they're going to have the house video camera that you see at malegislature.gov um rolling um and so you can watch that while you're on the phone talking to your division monitor um letting them know how you're going to vote or if you want to debate and then um we we can go from there so it, it's a it's a good system to to keep us going during these times but i think what's important is that it's not a permanent system i don't think any there are so many things that happen during formal session most of which are these side conversations that you know, it's like being in an office, you need to come in at least once every couple of weeks to make sure you catch up with everybody and see what's going on. Um, and being able to do that is really important for us. And so I don't think there will be a situation where we are meeting remotely beyond COVID mm -hmm. um, because th those converse conversations are you know, absolutely necessary um, for us to be able to do do our jobs well. Jack, anything to no, you, add to that? You. I just thought that offered a very comprehensive uh, vision of the, the need for uh, remote voting. I think just a couple things. Uh, early on, it was a group of progressive legislators who were pushing the governor to do more from uh, close down the schools to mandating face masks to early on closing down, down non-essential uh, businesses. Uh, but parallel to those conversations, uh, we also started uh, reaching out to leadership, the House Progressive Caucus, uh, with Rep. Michelle Socolo, Maria Robinson, uh, put together a letter outlining a vision for what we felt we needed uh, in this COVID-19 democratic process. Uh, yes, as, as Maria said, one rep can shut down informal session, uh, but folks who were fearful of losing their homes shouldn't have to go an entire day uh, until the next informal session to see if one rep alone can silence the democratic process. Uh, so. I'm very excited. As we know, the Massachusetts legislature uh, is a very old institution. Uh, I just found out today that not all of my emails that I send to Hotmail addresses actually get to Hotmail because there's some um, some issues uh, in our technology that we're working through. Uh, Does Hotmail blacklist? And, and Apparently, there's some Hotmail email addresses that I can't email to. Uh, we can spend a whole hour talking about that. Uh, but my point is that the legislature has been catching up on technology prior to COVID-19, uh, and now we're trying to figure out how to maintain this very old democratic institution, uh, yeah. but while also modeling public health. Uh, and I don't want my staff to have to go in there. I don't want to go in there myself, and I don't want to require any of my colleagues to put themselves in harm's way, while also modeling uh, exactly what we don't want to see in our constituents. Uh, and as Maria just mentioned, uh, today, if you turned on the news, you saw protesters, many of whom weren't wearing masks, weren't wearing face coverings, weren't wearing masks, uh, had signs that contradicted each other. Um, you can't be a communist and a fascist. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, but we, we see people who are ignoring public health mandates. Uh, we see people who are ignoring uh, the governor. They're ignoring their mayors. What they don't need are a bunch of state reps uh, modeling that same uh, unhealthy uh, and dangerous behavior. Uh, so I'm very excited. I think folks should tune in on Wednesday as we try uh, this process out. Uh, we're going to be voting on a bill that's very important, but also uh, not the most complicated bill we may take up. Uh, but I think the other point, too, is there are things that we need to pass. And while the mechanism of doing things in informal session has worked, 
more or less over the last couple months, uh, there are going to be bigger bills coming down the pike. And I haven't given up hope that we'll still be able to pass uh, comprehensive environmental legislation, for example. I haven't given up hope in the ROW Act or Safe Communities. Those, those were already uh, hills we were climbing and tall hills at that maybe for some of our colleagues. Uh, but I didn't believe, and I don't believe Maria or any of our progressive colleagues as well, thought that we should allow COVID-19 to be as an excuse uh, or a reason not to continue to push forward uh, for pieces of legislation that would help our constituents. And I just, just to dovetail on that last point, that I, I do think that we're seeing now why some of those bills are especially important. Specifically, one thing that I've often stressed with both the Safe Communities Act and the Roe Act, um, with the Safe Communities Act, uh, back in, I remember hearing stories in early 2017 about undocumented immigrants who were afraid to, to go to public, to go, to go to community health centers because ICE was loitering outside of them. And anything that makes somebody afraid to go to a community health center right now is terrible uh, and it needs to change. Uh, just as well as the fact that domestic violence incidents going up now. And so nobody should be afraid that seeking help in such a situation could lead to getting in, kind of involved in, in kind of possibly putting somebody at risk for deportation. Um, and the Roe Act, similarly, one thing that was fascinating to learn recently is that one of the only things still happening in person in courtrooms are the are the kind of the judicial bypass cases for minors seeking uh, kind of judicial approval uh, for abortion access, something that shouldn't even have to happen, and the, which, which which the Roe Act addresses. And you can just see the way that uh, this makes eliminating that hurdle shows why eliminating that hurdle is so important. Right, and and women who would otherwise travel to Colorado to get the services that they need cannot do so right now, yeah. and so. We have gone to the point of where we had eight weeks. We will certainly go to 10 weeks here of not having any significant amount of travel. So I think that that's a, a very long time uh, in the gestation period of a human being um, and, and really can change people over and into what is and is not legal for them anymore. In uh, that same vein, uh, Marie and I will be interviewing um, Rebecca Hart Holder. Uh, I think the executive director or president of uh, NARAL Pro-Choice Massachusetts uh, this coming Saturday, I believe, to specifically talk about the juxtaposition of reproductive justice and our new COVID-19 reality. Uh, but just to, to talk a little bit about Safe Communities Act as well, uh, one of the reasons we've been pushing the governor to do a statewide uh, mandate on face coverings uh, when social distancing isn't possible is because it confuses constituents to, to know that, okay, I'm in Framingham, so I have to wear my mask, but when I leave Framingham, this Board of Health and this community doesn't require it. Mm -hmm. uh, and wearing face masks is, and face coverings is so important, but for me, the parallels between confusing our constituents about where they have to wear face covering and where they don't have to, depending on where they might be standing in the state, mm -hmm. uh, the parallel between that and the plight of so many immigrants who in Framingham, their relationship with the police might be very, very different than if they cross the city border into another municipality, uh, which is why we need statewide order on face coverings. We need a statewide uh, clarification on the role of police officers as it relates to uh, the enforcement or not enforcement of federal immigration policy. Uh, the governor got there on many of the things, and one day we hope he'll get there on uh, Safe Communities Act as well. And then, so Maria, earlier you, you spoke about the, the evictions bill that the legislature recently passed. Can you tell people like a, a, a short version of what that does and why it was important? Sure. So the last thing we want people worried about right now is being evicted or foreclosed upon in their homes. Um, and so this provides um, both a moratorium during the governor's emergency order, as well as a little leeway time afterwards um, to allow people to um, pack to work in order to pay the, pay the bills. Um, as much as we love to think that the stimulus funding from DC is going to be helpful, and it will be helpful to many, um, $1,200 does not pay the rent in Boston or a lot of municipalities in Massachusetts. And so certainly for those people who have, um, who are unable to work and for any reason unable to quit employment, I mean, Jack and I spend 
like 80 percent of our days helping people get unemployment so there are lots of people who still haven't gotten the unemployment even if they're owed it um, who are not able to pay their bills right now and we don't want people to have to worry about either choosing between food and rent first mm -hmm. and foremost but secondly putting them out on the street i mean having people be homeless or for that matter moving in general right now is is dangerous to public health and you know the state is sorry specific elected officials are working extremely hard to find homeless people places to stay um, i can't necessarily say the state as a whole is is doing that but many of our colleagues are working tirelessly to make sure that people have, have a place to go. And that's one of the most important things we can do right now because that will also help to stop the spread. Um, and of course, congregate care locations, be it a homeless shelter or a nursing home are very dangerous places to be right now. And so we wanna make sure that we're um, providing as many options to people um, and making sure that they can be safe and socially distanced um, as necessary. And, and Jack, anything you want to add? No, I think uh, just a shout out to Mike Conley, who may just have aged out of being a, a mm -hmm. down by a year or two. Uh, I'm a couple months away from aging out myself, so I'm uh, some solidarity with Mike Conley there, uh, but definitely some true leadership there. And I know Mike worked with uh, House leadership and crafted a bill uh, that I think is a good model for the rest of the country. Uh, but to, to just bring back to another point Maria said, the issues that many of our constituents faced before COVID-19 uh, still exist. All those social inequities uh, that existed prior to COVID-19 are now just made worse. And if you were housing insecure before, uh, you're in a worse place. Uh, if you were food insecure before, you are in a worse place. And what this pandemic is, well, it's showing us a lot of things. Uh, but one of those things is the failures of our social safety net, even in a affluent, uh, well-educated state like Massachusetts uh, that prides itself in being bluer than Alabama uh, yeah. and maybe bluer than more states than, 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 than just that one. Uh, the reality is what this is showing me, and I think so many others, is that while we may have been this progressive city on a hill decades ago, we haven't been making the investments in the social safety net. And what I'm hoping, I have a lot of hopes for a post COVID-19 world, uh, but as more and more of our constituents who have always paid into a system, and yes, they've benefited from it, but maybe not in a tangible way, as more and more people are realizing the positive role that government can play, uh, no one, we're not going to GoFundMe sites to try to fix the unemployment issue. Uh, we're, we're not waiting for handouts from corporations and charity to trickle down. Uh, the government has an integral role to play. Even the federal government is stepping up uh, and making some positive investments. Uh, I think if Maria and I were in Washington, they would have been advocating for something a little different. Uh, but from the president all the way down to the city council and select boards in our community, people are stepping up into the role of what it means to be government. Uh, and I'm optimistic that over time we'll realize the failures of our country and our state prior to COVID-19 and what, how we come out of this, uh, who we come out of it as, uh, will be better than when we went in. Uh, my worry is that, well, First, we're all not going to get out of this. And as, as Maria said, if, if you're in um, uh, congregate care, if you're in one of our state prisons, things are, are scary. Uh, and to hear the statistics be dismissed by some leaders uh, as if they're reading a boring weather report of today, nine more deaths, today, 60 more cases. These are people's parents. These are people's kids. Uh, these are people's loved ones. Uh, and they're people that had hopes and dreams of what they wanted to do this spring. And now they're sick and now they're dead. Uh, and just because they lived in a nursing home or lived in a prison uh, or lived in an apartment building in downtown Framingham uh, doesn't mean that their deaths or their illness uh, don't mean something and shouldn't mean something to the rest of us. Uh, and then to see protesters like we're out in front of the state house today uh, 
it's just a reminder of how far we still need to go. Uh, and that even with the affluence and the education of, you know, that, that exists in Massachusetts, uh, you don't have to go to Michigan uh, to see protesters uh, hurting folks by uh, spreading misinformation and hate. You don't have to go to Alabama. You just have to go to Boston in front of the state house to see people uh, spreading hate and misinformation, uh, giving their fellow uh, constituents, their fellow residents a big F you uh, that I don't care about your health. All I care about is the bottom line and this altar I've made to uh, unfettered capitalism. Uh, and I'm just done. I'm, I'm sick and tired of making excuses for people uh, that prior to this, we, we would talk about political differences and solidarity and blah, blah, blah. And now we're seeing that there's a, there's a group of people, I hope they're in the minority, uh, but a loud growing group of people that isn't afraid to be quoted saying that the economy is more important than lives. Uh, I've long speculated, and I, I think the three of you probably have as well, uh, that people have put uh, money over and profit over people's lives. Uh, but now to hear elected officials just uh, say it so openly uh, and to see protesters gather out of anger because the economy that never really served them to begin with uh, is now not working. Uh, and what they want are more deaths so that they can feel a little better. I, I, I don't get it. Um, and that wasn't the question you asked, but I'm just <laughs> so disappointed. Uh, it, it's not surprising, uh, but I think anyone who thought that we lived in this utopian bubble of Massachusetts, who somehow um, forgot that more than 50% of Republican voters in the last presidential election in Massachusetts uh, voted for Donald Trump over other Republicans running in that primary, uh, giving Donald Trump his highest margin of victory yet. That was Massachusetts, 2016. These people haven't gone anywhere. Um, they're now gathering in front of the state house, arguing that your parents' lives and your grandparents' lives aren't as important as an economy that hasn't worked for anyone to begin with. Um, but I'm sorry, I'm gonna go back to Marie and the details of uh, remote. No, but, uh, just to, to go to one point that you raised in your earlier talk. So, just one thing quickly, I found it fascinating, this kind of weird uh, reification of the economy and discourse where like, whether it's to talk about say like reopening the economy, et cetera, that kind of abstracts the concept of the economy quite a lot, right? Um, which is always just fascinating. I have it almost like a quasi religious way of talking about the economy. But I wanted to go to the point of the safety net, which you mentioned earlier, Jack, about how the, the pandemic has been putting strain on, on the safety net that we have in Massachusetts, which despite our affluence, wasn't nearly as strong as it should be in the first place. What are some of the proposals that people are putting out there to, to strengthen that now, or even to strengthen it on the other side of this? Sure, I mean, we're talking universal basic income, baby, like Andrew Yang, uh, stuff that we in February, even those of us who were extremely progressive were kind of like, yeah, really? Is this what we're talking about? And and suddenly a month and a half later, it becomes a very real conversation. So that, you know, we're, we're talking about things like that. We're talking about decarceration efforts right now, which are long overdue, I think, for many of us who think that there are lots of people who absolutely do not belong in long-term prison. Um, but this just emphasizes the fact that, you know, we in Massachusetts don't have a death penalty and being in jail shouldn't necessarily mean that you are going to get massively sick and potentially die. Um, so we're having a bill about that tomorrow. Um, helping our um, immigrant communities is one of those things where the federal government is definitely not stepping up to the plate. You know, we've even if you were lucky enough to get a stimulus check, you weren't gonna get one if your spouse um, is an immigrant and who's, who does not yet have a social security number, um, even if you yourself are an American citizen. So there, there are lots of these, you know, um, value judgments being made through policy. Anyone who tells you that a budget is not policy is fooling themselves because all budgetary matters and where money goes um, is policy there. Um, so the, those are some of the things that are off the top of my head, you know, I, 
I have a hazard pay bill um, for something that we're talking about in the short term, but it really just emphasizes the fact that in the long term, our living wage is not terribly living, or sorry, our minimum is not terribly living. And we need to have a better living wage overall. Um, and so that, that's, I think, is going to be part of the conversation as people come to understand that um, working three jobs at minimum wage is just not mm -hmm. reasonable to ask of people in, in the long term. And I think we're getting a better understanding of the value of work. Um, whether you are a parent at home attempting to homeschool, as mm -hmm. both Jack and I are, to varying I think Jack's trying way harder than I am in homeschooling. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I just, I just want my kid to stay alive, and I think everything after that is like. Also, I learned that PEMDAS isn't a thing anymore. They use a new acronym, and so I got very upset. <laughs> sort of, um, um, yeah, you'll you'll get there, Jack, when you get to sixth grade math. It's it's ridiculous, but um, I think it's helping us better understand the value of teachers, mm -hmm. healthcare providers, um, of people who clean our offices, for God's sakes, who are people who work at restaurants who are often being paid under the table. Um, we have people who are out there working at grocery stores, front lines every single day, and they're under any circumstances, they are still expected to be there. And those people are not making a lot of, they are not making CEO kind of pay. Mm -hmm. And so I think defining the value of work is, is going to be different for us. Um, in a post-COVID universe because I think people are going to have a greater appreciation for roles that we didn't necessarily view as valuable uh, prior to this. So earlier you mentioned uh, a bill that you have on hazard pay. Can you just explain for people really quickly what hazard pay is? Sure. Hazard pay is saying that we're going to increase your pay because you are working in hazardous conditions. Um, in my case, it's a time, basically a time and a half bill for those people who are considered essential workers. But I know that there are lots of different proposals um, all over the country right now for figuring out how to uh, um, are using their own money to pay for uh, protective gloves. Um, face coverings, I won't call it PPE because I don't think any of them are accessing PPE in, in the official definition of it. Um, and that's true whether you're um, a receptionist at a hospital. Mm -hmm. there. Um, or the cleaning person, you know, there's, there's this wide range of people who are still being expected to work um, even though for, for many folks, it would be much safer for them to just go on unemployment um, during this period of time where we do have better opportunities under unemployment than we normally would. And that's an area where we are doing much better in Massachusetts um, because we actually in, invest in our unemployment system compared to the rest of the country. Um, gotta love Florida that has intentionally divested from their unemployment system to reduce their numbers overall, which is like a decade long scheme under Republican um, governors. So at, at least we're doing that much better. Um, but we still have, as Jack mentioned, a ways to go. But I will, I'll try and do this in a way that comes full circle here, which is to say that I think this is why electing young Dems is super important because A, we're bringing a lot of different viewpoints, right? Mike Connolly, as previously mentioned, Dave LaBeouf, they rent, yeah. right? Uh, they might be some of the very few people in the entire Massachusetts legislature that rent and are thinking about renters mm -hmm. and that ha might have, you know, di different circumstances. Um, of course, most of our staff rent. Um, and we hear from them, but it, it's saying that this is a perspective that might not have been thought about in the same way if we didn't have those, those folks there. Um, but I also think it means a, a little bit of openness to these new ideas mm -hmm. um, and, and being willing to see um, that different policy proposals that haven't necessarily people haven't necessarily been open to in the past are ones that we should be turning to in the future. And so I, I, I see a lot of really good ideas coming out of Young Dems, not, not least of which because we're, we're getting everybody technologically hooked up via Zoom and, and whatnot. 
um, and that's really helping us to continue our jobs in in the current times, but um, mm -hmm. also helping to to just legislate in in a more thoughtful fashion. Mm -hmm. Jack, anything you want to want to add onto what Maria was saying? No, I think uh, on the subject of what does it mean that we call somebody an essential employee, uh, yeah. and if we're going to call them essential, but they are now putting themselves in harm's way uh, with a slight, if not maybe no pay raise at all, uh, what, what, what does it actually mean to call them essential? And are we actually treating them as if they're essential or are we treating them as if uh, they are expendable? And I think that's the tension. Uh, I had to go to the grocery store today. Uh, the large number of folks at the grocery store uh, were young people uh or employees were young people uh people of color um they were largely the folks i interacted with today uh and as we've learned with the face covering and all of that that we wear face covering not to protect ourselves but to protect other people and the fact that it's taken us this long uh to get a order from the governor uh and before that orders from municipal leaders to Put it out there clearly that if you're going to go into a store, you need to cover your face. Uh, that's part of this, you know, we can talk about the pay of these essential workers, but anytime uh, somebody walks into a grocery store and isn't wearing a face covering, what they're saying is, uh, I might call you essential, but you're really expendable. Uh, and this, this um, selfish individualism that you can't tell me what to do, um, it's always been ingrained in the American psyche, uh, but just to see in the news, I think an hour or two ago, uh, that I think somebody was shot, uh, I think it was a security officer uh, in Flint, Michigan, trying to remind a group of people that they can't enter the store uh, without wearing a face covering. And that person who I'm guessing wasn't making a whole lot of money to begin with, who was already putting themselves in harm's way, already trying to protect the other employees of this establishment is now not going home to his family because a group of people uh, have gone from that really thin line from this rugged individualism uh, that it's, it's all about me to if it's all about me, you can't tell me what to do to now someone's dead. Uh, and that's a very tangible uh, situation that's, that's so sad. Uh, but what we also know is that that, that selfish individualism is already leading to people dying because of the high number of folks who are testing positive for COVID-19 uh, in these big, uh, these big establishments, these big stores. Uh, and if they're immunocompromised, if they're seniors, uh, people are already dying because people have refused over the last two months uh, to do what China and the, most of the rest of the world has long told us to do. Uh, Cover our faces, uh, help to, to keep the germs that we have uh, contained within us alone. Uh, I, you know, we could talk about so much, and I think Maria's pivot to why we need to elect uh, young folks is so important, but I think it's also important to uh, reflect on what it means to elect uh, diverse folks uh, from diverse life backgrounds, people that, as Maria said, are still renters, maybe will always be renters. Uh, buying a home is this part of this American deception that we all think we have to do it. Uh, but the reality is for a lot of folks, it's never going to be uh, what, what they consider their home. Uh, but people who have- We just bought a home because my husband doesn't play golf. <laughs> he needs something to do. But otherwise, <laughs> we, financially, we it it that's really makes sense. It was cheaper nine years ago than paying rent, but uh, the economy has, has turned in a different direction. Um, but what does it mean to have elected officials who have uh, diverse life experiences, who when they think about somebody working in a supermarket, they don't have to go back in time 30 years, uh, but they can think of their brother who still works at a supermarket. Uh, they can think of their parents who maybe still work at a childcare facility. Uh, and then what does it mean to elect folks who have connections uh, outside of our immediate communities as well? Uh, we've been bringing in uh, advice from around the country and around the world. Uh, one of the things that I'm grateful to a lot of the, the young Dems that are elected in Massachusetts is that we have these connections. We, 
we go to conferences and we travel. Uh, I know Maria went to South Korea uh, last year. I was able to go to China and to reflect with colleagues in other countries uh, because COVID-19 didn't start here. Uh, we weren't the first country to uh, have to deal with this new reality. Uh, but unfortunately, American arrogance has prevented us as a nation from really listening to China or God forbid Iran or Italy or Spain, countries that were dealing with uh, body counts way before we even uh, were trying to, to gather our thoughts, uh, who were giving us the, the warnings, telling us that it was something that you could be asymptomatic and spread, uh, were telling us uh, that it wasn't just seniors and immunocompromised folks that were catching this. Uh, and as a nation, we've ignored it uh, largely. And what I've been so grateful is to the colleagues who have those diverse connections, who have been bringing those connections forward uh, and reminding folks that we don't just have to tune in uh, to Trump's press conference uh, to get a, a one-sided view of this deadly pandemic. Uh, we have colleagues and friends around the world who are doing these, uh, doing the similar work in their own communities. Uh, and if we're not arrogant enough uh, to shut our ears, uh, there might be something we can learn. Mm -hmm. Andrew, but, I'm going to tag you in to ask oh. any questions you might have. Are you? You? Um. Well, you pretty much addressed uh, most of the questions that I had. Uh, and I was uh, following the Facebook pages and no one else has been asking other questions. But if anyone else has questions, uh, feel free to ask them. I'll, I'll ask one. Um... I'll ask one about, about like Framingham specifically, which you both represent. Just curious about like, what's it been like doing constituent services work right now? And like, what is this, um, how have you been, have you been adapting to that? Probably what I would expect would be like a, hearing from constituents a lot more than, than normal, but like a lot greater urgency uh, with many underlying issues that did predate, but um, the kind of the urgency and severity of it even more so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I want to say one thing is, Jack, I'm really glad that we're adding funding via the Student Opportunity Act, because I think education is our way out of this, um, by having a smarter, uh, a better educated populace, sorry. Um, so for me, you know, it was really important to reach out to people who weren't going to hear from anyone else. You know, our, our city is running a great program where they're calling senior citizens, um, but there are also a lot of people who don't know that they're supposed to call their elected official, right? Like. A large group of people do not know what a state representative is, what they do, what their function is. <laughs> Sometimes we're in that group too. Um, but I sent a mailing out to people and one of the things that was really helpful is um, I sent them a line that they can text and I've actually been getting a ton of requests through the text line or like I'll see someone comment on a Facebook group, the Metro West Moms, who was asking about unemployment. And so I'll just jump in and be like, hey, do you have questions about unemployment? Why don't you just like actually ping me instead of everyone guessing really hard at what you should be doing here? Um, it's been a big change. I mean, I think we try and keep it uh, closer to a balance between legislating and constituent services. I'd say it's much heavier on the constituent services now, um, just out of sheer need. Um, I'd say Framingham overall, we're, we've got some amazing, amazing nonprofits out there that are, are doing God's work uh, to keep people fed. And we've got this great community group that um, we're finding the mutual aid group there is, is phenomenal. Um, I think it's just one of those things where um, it, it's frustrating to us sometimes that we can't, um, that we rely on mutual aid groups instead of having the government be able to do all of these things um, and, and figuring out a way to make that happen. Um, but I think that's all, you know, it, we're doing a lot of different work than we would normally do. Um, we're, Framingham is a little bit of everything. It's like a microcosm of the Commonwealth in, in some ways in terms of um, distribution and, and makeup. Um, so we get to, get to see how it's impacting sort of everyone across the board, whether it's people worried about 
making rent or it's people worried about where their next meal is going to come from or senior citizens getting cancer treatments and worried about people touching the elevators in their building um and and not having a place uh a place where they can stand in the elevator that is six feet away from other people uh, which is maybe not necessarily something that i would have thought of on my own um with, without having that contact so i think anytime you can talk to a constituent it's a good thing um, and I hate that it's in these awful times, but it's helping a lot of people recognize what their government can do for them, um, which I am excited about very much so. Um, Jack? No, I think the, the balance between constituent affairs and legislation is one that uh, in this full-time plus job, we, we try to strike that balance and then you factor in family and maybe self-care, those are backburnered. Uh, but definitely over these last couple months, uh, it's been constituent services. And it's not necessarily something that we don't normally always do. Uh, there's always a couple cases, unemployment cases that we're trying to help people with. Uh, that's, that's integral to what it means to be a state rep. Uh, but what we're finding is that it's now 80, 90% of my time is literally trying to make sure that we, we don't drop the ball. And as we reach out to our state contacts and then wait for somebody to get back in touch with them, you know, I'm, I'm giving people my, my cell number saying, please just text me if you don't hear from anyone in a couple of days, because we don't want anyone to fall through the cracks. And when you're using Outlook and Google Sheets, uh, it's something, you know, as important as getting money uh, to pay the bills and to uh, make sure there's food on the table, uh, it just keeps us up at night worrying that oh, is there, is there one email that might have got dragged into the wrong folder? Uh, normally, if an email gets dragged into the wrong folder, worst case scenario, someone gets mad because you don't acknowledge that they send you an email about a bill that hadn't come up yet. It's very important to respond to all emails. Uh, but a lot of the emails that come through to us aren't always time sensitive. Now, probably 95% of them are. Uh, and Marie and I, as newer reps, uh, only have one staffer. Uh, our staffers are all working remotely as well, uh, also full-time plus. And so, yes, we are so appreciative of all of their hard work uh, and trying to uh, model balance by not texting them late at night or really, really early in the morning. Uh, but to Maria's point, we've been trying to find new and creative ways to make sure our constituents know we're here. Uh, Facebook continues to get more and more of my money uh, with targeted ads. Uh, we've had constituents translate ads into languages like Russian uh, and Portuguese, and then thinking creatively about how we can uh, target Facebook algorithms, for example, to try to get to those Russian-speaking constituents. Uh, there are ways, uh, but my fear is if we just rely on one platform, if we're just relying on Facebook, if we're just using English, uh, there are large groups of folks who simply aren't getting the, the information. Uh, they don't know that a state rep can, can make a phone call and try to get something uh, resolved. Uh, and so we're, we're working hard. Uh, we're, we're still, uh, I think most of the days, Marie and I talk all the time still, uh, our days start pretty early. Uh, and then Marie and I join a nine o'clock call with our mayor every morning. Uh, and then at 10 o'clock, I convene as one of the co-chairs of the House Progressive Caucus. Uh, we have a meeting every morning at 10 o'clock uh, where we share emerging best practices. Uh, we talk about legislation we're working on. Uh, for the first couple of weeks, we mostly talked about what the governor should be doing and wasn't doing and how we could push him more. Uh, and then, we spend the rest of the day responding to emails as it relates to unemployment benefits and trying to make sure that people are in the right lines and that folks are getting back with them uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, Marie and I have both been tempted on occasion to get the, the blow horn and the bell out and try to go into the, uh, the skate parks and the playgrounds. Uh, it's hard. And I think uh, most of our constituents are and have always followed the social distancing guidelines. Uh, but of late, there's more and more folks that seem to be turning a blind eye uh, to what's in our collective best interest. Uh, and so I, 
if you see Marie and I out with a, a bell and a blow horn one of these days, you've been warned. Uh, okay. What is a bullhorn? What is a blow horn? I don't even know. Um, I can't get your, that's the preacher side coming through. Well, Jack, two things. Jack has a great saying that he's said, which is, "We have to find, uh, you know, the there's a deep empathy that goes into constituent services, and right now we're finding people who are so scared because a lot of them are people who've only ever gone to a food pantry to donate food before." Mm -hmm. um, and Jack Jack coined that line, and I think about it all the time now um, because those are people who are really struggling with the idea that they need help. Um, but also when it comes to following social distancing, I know uh, young people get a bad rap and that's largely because of beaches in Florida and I don't take responsibility for anybody in Florida yet again. Um, but it, it was, I'm reading this, was reading this book about millennials in politics. It features young Dem himself, Eric Lesser uh, in it. But um, they made this connection between zero tolerance policies in schools when we were growing up to cancel culture that totally blew my mind and they're like that's why we would just like cancel everything because we have zero, zero tolerance for it. but i also think that means we're you know more equipped to deal with these really stringent policies because we grew up with these like very stringent policies. we grew up with bomb threats we grew up um with all of these drills that were not just fire drills but planning for all of these terrible worst case scenarios where your life is truly in danger um and so i think that's actually helped our generation cope in a very different way not to mention that we are already living most of our lives online you especially so, um <laughs> and and so that allows us and, and so we have skills that we can actually share with a lot of our colleagues with our family members um, people of other generations to help them better cope because they're not used to this. They're used to seeing people going for a cup of coffee in person. And so, you know, I, I encourage young Dems who are watching this to, to really think about that. Um, most people aren't used to doing things over Zoom. I, Kate Donna, who's, who's amazing, is running all these great phone banks for the special elections going on. And she's trying out doing Zoom for a, a phone bank. And I, I think that's a great new thing and hopefully we can use that moving forward to get more people um, actively involved and more millennials who don't actually want to leave their houses um, <laughs> to, to do things like that and so I think it's it's a great opportunity for us to also think about how how we can use this as a learning opportunity in addition to being the scariest time in our lives mm -hmm. and then was so one kind of final question I want to put out is Obviously, the legislature is spending a lot of time now was kind of in response to, to the ongoing to the, to the pandemic. But as you both noted, there were a number of issues that were really important in advance uh, that are kind of growing in importance now and will possibly be even worse. What are some of the like pre-existing pieces of legislation that you that you that you really want to make sure happen? We talked about this a little bit earlier, but what would your goals be for like when the session ends? Uh, for, for the formal session and for 2020, what do you want the Massachusetts legislature to have accomplished? I mean, for me, as always, it's climate change, passing the Senate climate bill, I think it's so important. And I can't think of a better metaphor for climate change than what we're going through right now. And if people can't put those dots together, I am more than happy to sit with a whiteboard and uh, connect those dots. <laughs> the next uh, YDMA my live stream. <laughs> I know I keep I keep saying I'm gonna get a whiteboard. I've been running oh my god, I can't believe I'm telling you this. I'm running congressional fantasy teams right now and it's a whole <laughs> a whole joke thing that I've got with group of people, but it is gonna involve a whiteboard at some point. So, you know, whatever. <laughs> We're working really, really, really hard, we promise. Uh but in those five minutes at the end of the day, Maria apparently is putting together a fantasy congressional team and uh I have allowed the kids to pull me into Mario Kart, uh, and then I lecture them about economic policy as it relates to what gifts you get while you're playing. And they're just happy I'm in the room with them, and I feel like I'm teaching them. Uh, but yes, I digress. Jack's ratio of children to parent to adults is very different than my house's too, so it's I'm important to remember. I'm surprised they're not here on my lap. Uh, but I think even before uh, all those pieces of legislation. Uh, Maria just mentioned uh, a budget that's not an austerity budget 
uh, we're, we're not going to cut our way back uh, to a healthy economy. Uh, our budget, as Maria said, is an embodiment of our values. And if we start cutting programming at a time where people need those essential services, um, things are going to be worse uh, on the other end of this. Not that we talk about the other end of this as if it's coming tomorrow. We could be in a COVID-19 reality for a year, a uh, year and a half. It, there are plenty of viruses that we don't have vaccines for. Um, we're going to be living with this for the foreseeable future. Uh, and all of those programs that needed funding before uh, still need funding. Uh, and I, I don't, I, I know we have colleagues that in the best of times have a list of programs they're happy to cut. Uh, and they don't seem to care about the lives harmed uh, or the quality of life diminished. Uh, now, where we actually see lives on the line, uh, mm -hmm. the idea that anybody would start advocating that all we need to do is just start cutting. Um, I would say it's we got to run the trains more. We got to run the buses more. We got <laughs> we can't have packed public transit, but we still need public transit because we can't have people in their own cars because we can't. We just can't. <laughs> so we're uh, you know. I'm grateful to have Maria and so many other young and young-ish and young at heart Dems in the legislature uh, to work with, uh, committed to really forcing and pushing Massachusetts to live into this idea that we have in our minds of what we are, or what we should be, or what we could be, uh, a commonwealth. Uh, and I think we're definitely going to get through this as a stronger commonwealth, uh, but Maria and I and our colleagues aren't going to allow people to sugarcoat uh, any of the uh, errors or holes or imperfections we're finding uh, in that commonwealth uh, as we gather together and try to be stronger on the other end. Um, people are afraid. And as Maria said, that's, that's the reality. Uh, as I'm getting angry emails or angry phone calls, I'm reminding myself that people are afraid in a way they haven't been in their lives. Uh, they're afraid because they have loved ones at a senior home and they, they have no idea if they're healthy or not, if they're dead or alive. Uh, they have loved ones in prison uh, for a misdemeanor that was supposed to be a, a year or two behind bars. And the only thing they hear from them uh, are the occasional email about how awful things are and how afraid they are. Uh, we have loved ones who have never felt that they had to ask for assistance in their lives and haven't got on their unemployment benefits for six or eight weeks. Uh, and they've dried up their, uh, their savings. Uh, even the people that were in a place to set aside the three months in advance, and most Americans weren't able to do that, even those people are struggling at this point. So you can imagine what it means for folks who are already at the fringes of our society. Uh, it's scary. And uh, what we all can do is not just say we're all in this together, but we can put on our flippin' face coverings. Uh, we can show respect to folks. Uh, we can stay we can home. Cancel student debt. We can cancel student. There's a lot of things we can all do collectively. Uh, and protesting in front of the state house uh, and using uh, contradictory terms to describe something you don't understand. Uh, not the solution. Stay home. Find your heart deep down inside of you. Uh, hug your kid. Uh, Take up a hobby if it keeps you inside and safe for these people who are, are causing such harm. Uh, but for most folks, know that we're here. We want to be helpful. Uh, if anyone feels alone or depressed, there are resources. Uh, there are text lines and phone lines. Uh, call a friend, even if you've never called them in a while, if you think they might be struggling, because uh, this isn't easy. Uh, but we're all here, and we all need to lean on each other and be there for others to lean on us as well. Andrew, any final things to bring in from the chat? Because I know you've been following the, the the various chats on Facebook. Hearing, um, I don't know if you, yeah. No, uh, no one's really been asking questions. People have only been thanking all three of you for doing the great jobs that you're doing. So that's great. And, and I'll, I'll use that as a wonderful transition to thank both of you again, uh, State Representatives Maria Robinson and, and, and Jack Lewis. Any final comments that you want to give uh, for those wa watching at home right now or watching later? 
reach out to your state representative if you're having problems, please. That's what we're here for, in all seriousness. Uh, let's see. You can find him at Rep. Jack Lewis. You can find, or Jack Patrick Lewis on most platforms. You can find me at Maria Robinson MA on Twitter, which is the only thing that I really pay attention to most of the time. Jack is much more prolific on Facebook. I'm trying to be better about Instagram. I'm old. I, I'm getting there. Um, we have not. I have a TikTok account, and nobody needs to know what that is. So anyway. <laughs> Seems like a good place to leave it, right, Jack? Yeah. <laughs> Just, and to take care of yourself as well. Yes. Uh, we're all please. finding ourselves in situations we never would have imagined. Uh, and sometimes there are things inside of us, stress or anxieties that we can't put our finger on. Uh, before we know it, we're we're getting after our kids for a math problem that's not their fault because we're just feeling the weight of the world on our shoulders. And so uh, if you can, get some sleep, take care of yourselves. Uh, and just know that we're here, your friends are here, oh. lean on each other, uh, and just, we're gonna get through. Awesome. Okay, Th thank you both again. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening, and thank you to everybody who is watching now, or will watch later when this is posted on YouTube.